Around a year ago, while live streaming, I came across a clip of the Joe Rogan experience featuring the guest Paul Stamets. I specifically stumbled upon a clip of Paul refusing to answer questions regarding portobello mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The inside. For clothes that twist and lock. At Bold 3 detergent plus fabric soft. Oh, like <laughs> Spray. Relief. If you don't cook them well, then these hydrazines uh, are potentially problematic. Now, nature's a numbers game. So there are beneficial compounds that in some balance may outweigh the negative effects of the hydrazines, the agaritines in these mushrooms, but that jury is still out, so what to speak. Are, what are the negative benefit or the negative effects of this? This is an explosive uh, uh, area of conversation and uh, puts my life in danger. So I, I reserve the right not to answer your question. Whoa. I didn't expect that. It puts your life in danger talking about portobello mushrooms? He's looking at me silently. I will uh, re respectfully move on. Thank you. That's impossible. I came a level being seen and it is virtually. I was intrigued. Why is a respected mycologist and uh, writer acting as though talking about a common mushroom could get you in any trouble? So I started searching online for answers. And digging around, I have found a few theories and observations that are certainly interesting. So let's try to answer the question, what or who is the mushroom mafia and what is going on with portobello mushrooms? Portobello mushrooms are the mature form of the common white button and cremini mushrooms. They were cultivated in Europe for centuries before reaching the U.S. in the late 19th and 20th centuries. For much of the 20th century, portobello mushrooms were largely ignored in the U.S. mushroom industry. Farmers often discarded them because they were seen as overgrown or past their prime, favoring smaller, younger mushrooms like white button and cremini. The portobello's large size and dark brown color made it less desirable to consumers, and it was not widely marketed. In the 1980s, a shift in consumer taste towards hardier, more flavorful ingredients, driven by the rise of gourmet cooking and vegetarian cuisine, led to a rediscovery of the portobello mushroom. Savvy marketers rebranded the large, meaty mushroom with the more exotic-sounding name portobello, possibly inspired by the Portobello Road Market in London. The rebranding worked. The mushroom's dense texture and umami flavor made it a popular meat substitute, especially in vegetarian and health-conscious diets. By the 1990s, Portobello mushrooms were featured in upscale restaurants, gourmet cookbooks, and supermarkets' produce sections across the country. Today, on average, Americans consume nearly three pounds of fresh agaricus mushrooms per person annually. While specific per capita consumption data for portobello mushrooms alone is not readily available, their significant share in the brown mushroom category indicates substantial consumption nationwide. Today, most of the United States mushrooms come from Pennsylvania, specifically in Chester County, which accounts for over 60% of the country's mushroom production. Mushroom cultivation in Pennsylvania began around 1885 when William Swain, a Quaker florist from Kennett Square, decided to experiment with growing mushrooms under his greenhouse benches. Seeing success, he built the first mushroom growing house and soon began commercial production. Chester County has solidified its reputation as the mushroom capital of the world, producing over 500 million pounds of mushrooms annually, worth more than 500 million. One of the first things you will come across when searching this topic is that portobello and similar mushrooms could cause cancer or other damage to the DNA of humans. This is not a new claim. What is new is outpouring of studies and research now being done regarding the carcinogenic properties of portobello mushrooms. Some studies have claimed that cooking the portobellos at high temperatures can help this problem. This leads to one theory. Massive companies inside the U.S. have an interest in making sure the primary product they sell can continue to make profits. This means making clear that their mushrooms are healthy, cheap, and abundant. 
So someone like Paul or anyone else making claims otherwise might find themselves in the crosshairs of these companies. Paul has made statements before regarding portobello mushrooms, and that seems to back this up. Button mushrooms are thought by many experts to be highly carcinogenic when they're digested, which can cause uh, tumors and abnormal cell divisions. It's a unique um, chemical that's in button mushrooms and portobellos. They, they are very much analogous to smoking a cigarette, except the agaritines cause tumors all over your body as opposed to just in your lungs. The compound that is found in portobello mushrooms that is carcinogenic is agaritine. Agaritine is a naturally occurring compound found in various mushroom species. It's a hydrazine derivative, and that is the important part for all the theories I came across. Hydrazine is a colorless, highly reactive, inflammable liquid with an ammonia-like odor. It is a powerful reducing agent and is mainly used as rocket fuel in industrial chemical work and in water treatment to remove dissolved oxygen. Hydrazine is highly toxic and can be dangerous to handle due to its volatility and potential to form explosive mixtures with air. Hydrazine is one of those things you don't go googling without risk of being on a list someplace in a federal building. For the record, it does this. Now, I want you to take everything I say from this point on with a healthy spoonful of salt and maybe a mushroom while you're at it. Biofuels are a giant market, and the market is only growing. Mushrooms have, over the years, been talked about as something that can be used in the production of biofuels as well as being utilized to lower costs. One of the fuel derivatives that could be produced is agaritine, agaritine becoming hydrazine, meaning jet fuel. So it stands to reason that weapon manufacturers, fuel companies, and even militaries could very well see these mushrooms as an opportunity. Not only does this create an opportunity to produce fuel cheaper, but it creates an opportunity to hide that you are producing that fuel in the first place. The term black budget refers to government spending that is classified or hidden from public records for security reasons. It is primarily used for funding secret military operations, intelligence agencies like the CIA or NSA, and advanced technology development. The details of these expenditures are not disclosed to the public or even to most government officials, making it difficult to track how the money is spent. Some examples of these black budgets at work are mass surveillance programs like PRISM that were revealed by Snowden, the development of many stealth aircraft, secret bases like Area 51, and many black sites. These things require money, and fuel for that matter. So, the way this could all connect is simple. The military produces fuel and maybe more from the mushrooms, they sell some and keep the rest. All this money that could amount to billions is perfect for black budget applications, and at the end of the day, it's like the money, fuel, mushrooms, and all the research that went with it never existed. One thing in all my research is clear. Paul is right, that he is touching on a strange and oddly sensitive topic, one that is a rabbit hole for sure. I'm not sure how to come down on everything i found, as it's hard for someone with my background to parse. Mushrooms and biofuels are not my strong suit. But I can certainly say that something is up with these mushrooms, and as funny as it might sound, the mushroom mafia might be very real, and bigger than most would think, maybe even involving U.S. military, federal governments, the CIA, so on, so on. It's a very interesting story, and, and one that I think there's a lot to still dig in on. I don't think I've even scratched the surface on this thing. In fact, I really just sort of made this video to be a primer for people to start looking into this because I find it interesting, and I've only gone back so far in documents that I've found and studies that I've been able to dig up. So I'm hoping some people in the comments can let people know of some things they found regarding this whole rabbit hole. And if you guys have some information that I didn't share in the video, maybe let me know in the comment section down below, and I'll try to reply to people, and maybe I'll make an updated version of this video, or we'll cover it again on a live stream. 
If you guys enjoyed, please subscribe. If you liked the video, like the video. If you didn't, go ahead and dislike it, but let me know down below why, and I'll talk to y'all later. Bye.